work according to Arab timing, unfortunately. Good morning. Thank you for coming here today on time, although you had a busy time yesterday. Today we will talk about Chris uh, cross-border collaborative investigation and it's the uh, fashion these days it's the fad some of them stay for a year others for five years let's see how time it will take uh, a lot of people are fond about it a lot of people want to work on it journalists editors around the world are very supportive to this topic what is this topic what's our experience in this regard how to learn from the lessons in the past this workshop will talk about this and we will keep the last 30 to 45 minutes to listen to you about your positive and negative experiences in this regard and also hear from others who would like to go for it. Uh, what do they have in mind? Of course, you can retweet using hashtag Arij, hashtag Arij19 to follow up with you uh, on the discussion on social media. I studied at BA in Birzeit University in Palestine 20 years ago, and I had my master's in Leeds in the UK in 2003. The basic ideas that I studied is that the media work is a team work. You need to work in a team. When I went to the field, however, and worked in TV stations in different newsrooms, I found out that it's not a teamwork. Every individual is selfish. I can say they are selfish. They think of them they think that the story they are working on is their story, their own position. They don't want others to get involved. Maybe get involved after publication, but before that, no. And actually, it's an issue with a lot of journalists. And investigative journalists are not an exception. They also think that their stories are their own positions, nobody should get involved. 2010 and beyond, after all the chaos in Paradise Papers, WikiLeaks, uh, Panama Papers, editors asked journalists to cooperate with each other and cooperate with other institutions. So what we talked about was not an issue for individual journalists. It was an issue for institutions as well. So um, after 2010, we started to make institutions cooperate with each other. And there's, if there is one story different institutions can share, they don't need to keep it for themselves. And different institutions can publish at the same time and have the story in a different way for their own audience. And they found out that the impact is more than they expected. Looking at the real impact, this is the way it should be done. We now have an opportunity that, meaning that editors and institution heads including international media agencies, they look for cross-cultural collaborative investigation, unlike what it used to be in the past. Cooperation now is the basic thing. And it's one of the things that we need to think about in the future or for the future. The issue here is that each team thinks of itself as one of these ships in an ocean. I have my own track, and other ships, they have their own tracks. And we hope that this is the case and it will remain the case. Five, four or five people work together in a wonderful environment with no obstacles. It's a lovely life. And this is what we think, or this is what we assume. But actually, reality is not the same. It's a chaos. 
sometimes we publish an important story or investigation and we found out another investigative uh, investigative journalist or institution haven't even heard about this story so this is an issue there we need cooperation cross border investigative cooperation is the most appealing issue nowadays but it's very complicated it's getting attention but it has its own uh, complications and obstacles talking to investigative journalists juniors in the Arab world we found out that they want to work by themselves. They don't want to cooperate with others because they think that it will be complicated and they would like to protect their own stories. However, I believe that anyone of uh, journalists can be part of investigative journalism across borders. So anyone can be a part of an international team for cross-border investigative journalism. What do we mean by cross-border investigative journalism? Sometimes it's more than one country, two countries, for example. If we're talking about one country, we don't think of the investigation as cross-border. Sometimes we work in uh, a whole continent or different continents. Recently, there were calls about cross-border investigative journalism that had a condition to have journalists from different continents to call it cross-border. Do we have work on the world level? Yes, we do. So the uh, basic idea here is the geographical concept or notion to it. In the Arab world, for example, in the MENA region, we speak common language and we can be cross-border. Of course, there are many other languages and dialects, but we can do cross-border investigations. And there are some investigations that are published in many languages to talk to different audiences. Speaking of institutions, sometimes we have three or four institutions that work together, sometimes two or three freelancers with one institution, or more, t more than 10 or sometimes tens of institutions work together. So. We need to take institutions into consideration, languages, geography, because the nature of the cross-border investigation will be different. A lot of people tell me that they have worked in on cross-border investigations, but when I ask more, for example, those people who say that they worked on such a thing, I found out that it's not cross-border investigation because it doesn't have the elements we talked about. This In this region, we all speak Arabic, so it's easy for stories to spread from Bahrain to Mauritania, and it's rare in the world, in the whole world, uh, planet Earth, we've. It, it's true that we needed some some adaptation to some stories that we have worked on. Uh, an Egyptian friend, uh, for example, told me that we wanna use in this story. Uh, um, the lunar calendar term, not the lunar calendar term, but a transliteration of the English uh, month. Um, Iraqi said we need to use the lunar Arabic term. So I said to them, this is a, not an issue. It's just a matter of adaptation. And we can produce two versions because we are talking about different audiences in Egypt and Iraq, and it w this won't change the story. So what is the cross-border investigative cooperation? The main idea is to have different 
um, reporters or journalists from different number of countries that cooperate in research for one story or one case, not necessarily one story, but it can be one theme. They support each other and audit information and facts together. This is the idea, together. They do fact checking and verification together. Each one of them is the editor for the other one and they support each other. Then they put the different pieces together to get the general picture And finally, they present to different audiences, whether we're speaking locally in a small newspaper in a specific town, for example, or to the region or to the national level, or even uh, on the pan-Arab uh, level. So the foundation here is how to work on the research, how to do the fact checking how to put the different pieces together to get the general picture and the main story then present the story to different audiences please go ahead apparently there's a question or a comment but please use the mic what's your name my name is amal al Ghawanme from the media college in al yarmouk university we said that cross border means two reporters work on one case. They do research to work on one story, but the research is done between two or for two communities. Well, each one of them, of the reporters, work on research themselves and they go to the field, not just behind the desk. Let's say that, for example, we want to talk about one, a case, a given case like uh, licensing issues for vehicles or cars. We're doing one in Jordan and one in Egypt. Each reporter needs to do his own research. Uh, are there specific tests or examples to be done to get the licenses or some people go around the bush to get the um, licenses? So each of the reporters in Egypt and in Jordan, they do their own research, but from day one know that they will co-publish the story. It will be about Jordan and Egypt, so they will f after they do the research, they will find the similarities, what are the common points. And this we're talking here about a simple case. Imagine when we talk about the whole or the entire Arab world. If we want to include Lebanon, for example, do we have these same common points? What are the differences? So are we comparing here? It's not comparison. It's one case, one, one story. Uh, one issue, but there are different applications in different Arab countries. And from day one, the reporters agree that they are working on one story and they will put the different pieces together. They won't publish it separately. So what about the editing mechanism? Is it this similar? In research, yes. In, in support, yes. In, in fact-checking and protection, yes. But when we present it to the different audiences, it's different. We may make it different. Okay, Amal? Okay. Thank you. If you have any questions, if you don't understand any of the parts, please raise your hand. We have four main questions. The first question is, is each topic or can each topic be a topic for cross-border investigative journalism? Yes and no. Each idea, we can develop it to make it cross-border um, idea. But there are some topics that are inherently cross-border ideas. For example, a company that does work in Venezuela, but the impact of the work is shown in Sudan. The simple way about the licensing for vehicles is a simple example. But 
However, in the other example, the the idea itself, the topic itself is inherently cross-border. The company's headquarter is in Venezuela, but the impact is in Sudan. So I need to work with journalists um, in Sudan and in Venezuela to develop the story. Ideas are available to everybody. We here can develop 1,000 ideas. Don't say that someone stole my idea. This ideas can be stolen while processing. How? The first, the first question we need to ask ourselves when we work on a cross-border topic is the topic or about the topic how many journalists we need to work with in different countries. The second question is, what's the best way to organize the, cross the professional cross-border work? How they will meet, whether in the first meeting or other meetings. It's preferable that the first meeting will be in person. And after that, other meetings can be virtual. So we need to think about the best way for organization. Third question, what are the best ways to ensure the smooth and safe work of investigative journalists? In other words, not to, sab to ensure not to sabotage this story and publish this story um, unintentionally, because if it's exposed or in, in exposed in one country, it will be exposed in other relevant countries. And lastly, how to adapt the results to different platforms. Maha works in TV, my other colleague in newspaper, another one in a radio. So the outcome needs to be adapted differently. So from day one, we need to make sure that the results are adaptive to not only to different audiences, but to different platforms of different needs. This happened before, and it was successful. So we are not inventing something that did not happen before. It was tried, and it was successful. The seven main steps for cross-border investigations. First of all is networking, and we will talk about all the steps in detail. The first one is networking. Second is idea or idea processing. Third, um, research team formation. Fourth, the research plan. Fifth, a second research. We are focusing on research here because it's very important for this kind of investigations. Sixth publication, which is a very complicated process. A lot of people think it's an easy thing, but we actually we start to think about it very early um, in uh, step one or two. And the last step, which is more networking and more work. So the cross-border uh, cross investigations are not linear investigations. They are like a cycle that will take us back to the same to the main point or to the first step, which is networking. Let's talk about networking. One of the m most important objectives for a reach is networking. In a reach, we need to uh, meet other people. I don't want to I don't want to see you networking with people that you work with all the time or you work with in the same country. So you need to network with different others. How? It's easy. Go and ask about your na their names. What do they do? You may find out that those people work in a similar field to yours. And networking doesn't mean competition. We are here to complement and work with each other. So it's not this. Don't say that I don't like that person. I don't want to meet him. He works in an institution that has its own way or own agenda. Well, meet that person. It's not necessary or important that you like him. Don't feel that you are rivals. It's not the case. Networking 
is mainly based on confidence and trust. I need to trust the people I work with because I need to put all the documents, all the information, or all sources, of course, except for some sources because some uh, because some sources are very confidential. Only the editor and the reporter or journalist need to know. So sometimes it happens. Other than that, we should not hide any information. And trust is very important. We build the trust. Trust is earned. We need to go together through different or, or all different experiences to make sure that this person or this colleague is trustworthy. One, an important step to pay attention to is do not steal your colleague's story. If you have this in mind, do not go for cross-border investigations. Once it happens, nobody will trust you again. If one reporter or journalist is labeled as an ID a thief, nobody will work with him on cross-border investigations. So it's a risk. Don't try it. Theft in the virtual world and um, stealing documents and sources is like stealing and, and theft in real world. I shouldn't take from Maha, for example, few lines from her story and put them in my story without telling her or giving her credit. In addition, we should not make any secrets in this story. We should not hide anything from our colleagues because we may need, uh, because this w will change the whole story in the future. And it's happened before. It's not something that I am making up here. It's happened that one person tried to steal a story and publish it under his name. And it also happened that, for example, Aisha learned an important information from the source but she wanted to make a scoop for her own institution, so, so she hid some of the information from her colleague, and this jeopardized the story. This, the whole story may, be, may change if we had information, may collapse, so we need to make sure and tell what we have found out from different sources. Networking. Networking takes time. And Journalists who participate or work with Arij um, have this golden opportunity. They have been working with Arij for a long time, so they already have good networks and previous experiences, which is good. It helps a lot. We have different kinds of networking on the specialization level. So I am a journalist, and I know different journalists in the Arab world. We are uh, work on the same field or specialization. I always work on um, illegitimate immigration, so, and they help me in this field, and we help each other. Sometimes it's a one-time networking. I may talk to a friend in Mauritania, ask him for information, and he gave me that information. It was a one-time thing, but it was very important. If I didn't have my friend Salik in that country, I would have needed to take a plane to go to the country and get the information. So that's why it's important to make good networking with different reporters in different countries. Third, um, a limited, uh, net, limited networking. For example, I tell my friend Firas in Palestine, this is what I need from you, one, two, three, four, an interview. I won't be able to send a correspondent from Amman. I need you to take, to film the interview. Um, this is the person and these are the questions and this is why we want to do it in order to get him involved in the discussion, understand the discussion. And it wasn't as simple as a phone call. He actually worked hard on finding or getting our story. Also, we have another kind of networking, which is a broader networking. 
and it's it's cross border here. Uh, actually, if you go back and look at the things that you've worked on, you will find yourself that you've used all these kind of networkings. And in the last one, we mean that we are different, for example, working from different newsrooms from different countries on the same story or the case. Second, idea. Where do I get the idea from? I want to I wanna work in this regard, on this idea. We always ask ourselves this question. What's the idea? Actually, the idea is by itself is not what's important. It's the angle of the idea. So how, how about what I think about these things? From everything around us, regular news, institutions, observations on streets, um, comparison with other uh, countries that worked on similar ideas or the same ideas, the worst thing that can they, a reporter can do is to kill the ideas, to do them like after two years or three years. You need to have the passion to do it right now, if it's about right now. If you keep postponing it, you will never do it even after 10 years. If you see hope in this idea or this stories, go for it. Ideas in cross-border investigations, we need to think in a win-win situation mindset. We all, all reporters, need to have the same passion to make sure that their it's their own baby, their own story, and their idea. Sometimes journalists feel, or make other journalists feel that they hire them. They are not there to cooperate. So some journalists make others feel that I have this story done, but I have this very secondary or minor part of it. It's not related to the main thing. So would you please look at it? And this is not cooperation. This is not a win-win situation cooperation. This happens to foreign reporters who come to work in the Arab world. They tell Arab reporters that we are working on a cross-border investigation. And uh, reporters in Sudan, for example, work on a small part, and foreign reporters in Finland, for example, work on the majority of the story, and they call it a cross-border investigation. Actually, it's not, because different reporters and journalists need to be effect equally effective and equally work on the same story. Any questions? Please give her the mic. My name is Aziz Anofel from Palestine. The first investigative journalism in cooperation with Arij was about the flood of criminals from Palestine to Jordan. What year? 2011. Okay. We had to change the jour Jordanian journalist three times because we were looking for a journalist who was able to get information from the security, uh, from security agencies, but some of them withdrew. The reporter who continued to work with us continued to work with us until before publication, but we had. We ha he, he, he had to work with us at the latest stage of the process, not at the beginning. So do you consider that he got the whole idea? I don't think so, because he didn't start working with us from day one. Of course, I understand. But with the information he got, he made the confrontation uh, possible. Actually, we had it to get information from the Jordanian authorities, and we got them. So what's your question here? My question here is, you said that we need to have people to work with each other from the very beginning, from step one. 
but sometimes there are complications that we don't foresee or we don't understand. So I didn't understand complications of media work in Jordan because we haven't met with each other from day one. Uh, right, I understand. So this is an important point. Yeah, I understand. So. If we understand complications or this media situation in Jordan, we would have been able to face these situations and find solutions. Exactly. I understand that cross-border investigations are expensive and costly, and sometimes we, you may need to meet in a third country, not in Jordan or Palestine, but it's very important to have a plan and to meet. The research plan is very important. And commenting back on what Aziza said, to us, the, the, the plan is like a straight line, but on, in reality, it's not a straight line. There are obstacles and uh, um, complications. If it's a straight line, beautiful line with no obstacles, we can publish hundreds of investigations per year. So let's say the conditions for the research team. The research team that we want to compose uh, is should be varied, varied experiences. The more experiences it has, the better it is. This means we ha we need a reporter who's good in data, another one who understands the story, another one who has access to this case. The wider the variety is for the team members, the better it is. So it wouldn't be it wouldn't be okay to have somebody who even if he's or he or she is working on a story in the Arab world and then finding the team made up of four people, none of them is speaking English. <coughs> this doesn't work at all. Language skills are essentials. We should have uh, English. I do not understand an, uh, if an investigative journalist doesn't have a second strong language. And I do recommend you, if you want to develop yourself, to strengthen your second language. Because in Arabic, you cannot have access to sources and access to the real databases that you can view even with uh, Mr. Google, even using Mr. Google. It is very weak. But in, in Arabic, it's very weak. But in English, French, German, it's much better. It will be of more benefit. Also, a specialty. I need somebody understanding the legal background of a certain story. Somebody having an experience regarding the health aspect of the topic I'm working on. The but the more that I had that person right from the beginning, that would strengthen my stand because it will strengthen uh, my research. In this phase, do you remember what we said a little while ago about these points? In this phase, the research team, not in a latter phase, here we assign the date of publication. This is a really important point with a lot of problems that happened before. We try to benefit from this experience that throughout this phase, do you see over here? We should assign the date of publication. By this phase, we would have a clear perspective. When are we going to publish? Because, for example, within three months, we will publish. Within four months, we will publish. Why is this important? Because throughout many experiences, a lot of real problems happened due to postponing the publication date. If you postpone it for the first time, then that's it. It will be endless postponing. So, regardless of all of the pressures that you will face, all of the obstacles that you will face, you should stick to the timeline. For example, Leila has a TV show on Monday, but we have decided on to the 29th of uh, uh, November on the uh, fr uh, on Friday. And then she would be like, oh, but our show is on Monday. Please just postpone for those three days. And we, we would say, no. It's on the 29th. It means on the 29th. You cannot keep um, lining up with all of the institutes and agencies. In one country, the, we, ha we may have uh, three uh, TV stations uh, for newspapers, etc. If each one would ask you to postpone, then it will be endless. Another point number two, choosing the partnering and participating countries and also the media platforms in order to make an influence. So I should start networking uh, in 
within this phase, if I'm not publishing in my own name but in the Guardian, the Guardian would say, uh, like, we will be publishing here. If we are in one, two, three, four, line heads up. After two, three months, we will be coming up with this story. It is really important to assign and identify, and identify the security methodologies for the, the investigative journalists. How are we going to communicate, coded emails, etc., etc. All of these points should be assigned and identified throughout this phase. We're not going to talk about the Facebook or Messenger for anything at all, not even an introduction and networking, not even. I don't want to see all of you all of a sudden adding each other on a friend's Facebook. Come on. Any person on this earth would doubt and suspect why all of a sudden they became friends on Facebook. Okay, now regarding the action plan. Okay, we sat together, we meet, we met. Now we have to develop the action plan. My core recommendation, even if we cannot do it all the time, but it is really preferred to gather everyone working on the story should sit on the same table, eye to eye. If you ask me why, and there is technology, no. Face to face is unmatchable. So, this is the hypothesis. Uh, for example, you will be discussing this is the hypothesis of our case. These are the data, etc., etc. Then, work division. Who's going to do what? We don't want to do this uh, rush reaction uh, and, or, and overlapping and duplication. No. And I don't want anyone telling me in the Egyptian accent, I've got every, everything here in my head. No, 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 no. Divide on paper. Divide the tasks, tasks and roles on paper. And then the most important point is to choose the coordinator, the work coordinator for the whole project. Who will be this coordinator for this cross-cutting, cross um, cross-border investigation? And then another point regarding financing. Who's going to finance it? Maybe it needs uh, travel, a certain experience, or the test, uh, travel, translation, etc. Sometimes whole stories fail because some of the resources um, withdraw and they do not give the necessary uh, fun financing for the project. Also, within this meeting, person face to face meeting, we should agree on uh, how to spend this uh, financing, so the expenditure, expenditures. We need to agree exactly on that. Any questions till now? Okay. Now the coordinator, our friend, the coordinator, Firas. Ex so Firas, for example, sorry Firas, I'll use you as an example. Firas would say, I will be the coordinator. What's our first word? Beware, beware Firas, beware, be aware, because this coordinator should be available at all times, because you will be speaking to different time zones, different countries, different journalists, each journalist uh, uh, finding different uh, different sources, sometimes having emergency cases. So you should be available at all times. You may never disappear or become offline. If you are away for like one hour or three hours, then it is an alarm. Oh, person X is not on uh, online for three hours. Um, this means maybe, for example, he has a flight, and on the flight he doesn't have internet. And if this is the case, then he will be writing and announcing to us that I'll be off for three hours or more because I'm on a flight. Otherwise, this is an alarm. It means he disappeared. It means he's in trouble. Also, understanding the different cultures for the people that we work with, because there are deep understandings of the cultures, even in the understanding of the journalism. you. Consider it as a for granted. Yeah, maybe we, people do that in, this, in the same uh, methodology. No, 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 no. And many people do it in a different way, totally different way than you do it. Even the namings of stuff. Um, most simply, if he tells you, like, I'm going to send you the director, the word director differs from one country to another, or even the producer. Uh, I will be sending uh, the assistant. Who is that person? What does he do? What is his task? You should understand the differences, the deep differences in the namings and the titles. What I understand now is that the coordinator should be one from the team. And 
Uh, would it better to be uh, the uh, journalist uh, mm -hmm. uh, number 11? Because from uh, our investigation experiences, we know that uh, the coordinator's role is not complementary. It is essential. So it is very important to have him as a colleague number 11 in order to coordinate the story to come out. He shouldn't be one of the team. Yeah. Sometimes this works to bring a full-time coordinator for the project, but within the massive project, we, did, we didn't make it to a success to bring an external project coordinator because he should be involved in the story, otherwise he wouldn't understand the context, he or she, of course. No, no, no. So yeah, most of the journalists, so if you are an investigative journalist and then you have this important story, if we told you to be just a coordinator, you will be like, Ugh, I'm not really interested in just being a coordinator. Okay, can we focus more on this? Because what we suffered f from uh, here is this uh, phase between the uh, following up, finalizing the story and publication. This is the most difficult uh, phase. So we should uh, d d we should change our understanding that his role is really important. Yeah, even in the Western one, for the cross borders, even the coordinator had a uh, little part of the research. Uh, the coordinator wouldn't be a full-time coordinator only. Also, the coordinator doesn't have eight hours, seven days a week. So for us, for example, it's four months uh, of work. So he can, he or she cannot be uh, only a coordinator doing nothing at all. So this is the idea. In within most experiences, the coordinator would have like um, two to three hours daily being a coordinator. And the coordinator has another work, maybe on another story, but the coordinator is an essentially a, journal a journalist. So sometimes we had this uh, suggestion, bring a project manager, just an, an administrative person, not a journalist. Such experiences were not a success because the non-journalists didn't understand anything from what we do. So we have tried this and it was a total catastrophe. That's why we had to change it very quickly. And then we were like, oh, he's going to ask right from and reinvent the wheel. So he will waste our time. That's why we, okay, he should be with us. He or she should be with us, but they should uh, recognize them and acknowledge the importance of the role. And also the, uh, he or she are not the editors. Mm, so you are not the chief. You help us a lot, but you are the coordinator of the whole process. One, two, three, four people. What are they doing to where we have reached the document? What happened to it? So if we received the 20 documents, uh, who's going to categorize them? What is the synopsis? The coordinator is going to do all of that. So I work. Uh, in a lot of joint and participatory investigations between myself and also the, uh, the person who's updating the Google Drive, etc. But maybe in the cross cross border, maybe in order just to eliminate the idea of having uh, an editor ma manager, uh, maybe the coordinator can the coordinator be the editor of the story, or oh, that's also not accepted also not accepted did you understand her question that the main editor is the coordinator for the big story of the of the big picture no because not so this goes within uh, as same a certain phase in a story but usually the coordinator is either a journalist or a producer if it's a tv investigation but it's really important for the coordinator to motive people, to thank them for their work, if, uh, to ask and check on the people. So y the coordinator should act more like a psychologist uh, if he or she will assume that position. If he cannot do that, then apologize. Do not assume the position. If you, assumed, if you took the position, then you should fill your the, the, all of the duties. So also, the coordinator is not in the field. And for example, the Algerian, uh, the journalist in Algeria tells him that this is impossible. So 
the coordinator may be recording a historical mistake, pushing the reporter, the field reporter. No, try. Go to the limits, push the limits. But no, that's a historic mistake. That's why that's why it's it's really important to have the journalist understanding the field and we should trust his or her field decision making capabilities and also to trust the journalist and the reporter uh, if he can or cannot do the work so the person in the field regarding his or her own safety or security telling you i can or you cannot do that you should trust give them all trust also the organization and the planning are essential if that person if the coordinator is chaotic that wouldn't work just cancel them so if we have uh, like 50 per people, we cannot have them uh, within one working group. Each five or six would be within one working group. And also arranging periodic communications with them. It's not only this uh, uh, group, the Latin Americans talking in Spanish who forgot them totally from this project. No, that cannot be the case. We should ask them and communicate with them like on a weekly basis. What happened? What happened with you? What are you doing? What's the plan? What What's next? So uh, the coordinator should give an update, a weekly update of like what's happened to the story. We, we are here and we are there. Also, do not leave the editor in the darkness and say, oh, I'm the Superman and I will solve all the, all the problem. No, if there is any problem, please notify the editor or editors with what's going on. That, for example, there is a danger, there are challenges that we may take out or extract uh, our reporter. And also, manage the expectations. You cannot say, oh, we'll get the moon down to Earth. No. There are reasonable expectations. This is the minimum limit and this is the maximum limit of the stories. We cannot magnify the maximum limits 10 times, tenfold. Also, share all information with the coordinator, except in certain cases the, uh, for the confidential sources. So we share the information, but not the source. This applies also for the victims, their photos, the things that we are going to um, put the picture in, a, a, in an unclear manner. Also, then coordinate and then in the middle and then the finalize, finalizing. Khulud Masalha. I do understand the trust between the team, but how can I trust my uh, colleague if he brings me uh, a source, an, uh, an anonymous source? And this is really massive. This is becoming massive. This is an increasing phenomenon. Uh, so the trust between the team members we should be to the extent that we know the sources uh, of, our, of each self. In order to protect your colleague, do not uh, Tell him your secret source. No, this is to the editor. So if you are a freelance working within your small group, then the editor knows the source. But your colleague in another country with another editor uh, under another agency, it is not a weakness of the trust. It's a protection for the source. The source gave you the information, Khulud. You cannot, in any case, tell about that anonymous source uh, for anyone else but you have the trust in the editor and in the agency that you're working for that's the reality of our work but we cannot work with all of the 30 um we cannot share the source with all 30 uh, reporters that we work with cross-border it's really important your name so far so if we have a secret source or a victim that we are afraid for their best interest and they don't, don't they want to stay anonymous so uh, by law 
by virtue of law, you can do that, not tell the names of your anonymous source. But it will, will always be better if you have a good trust between you and your editor to make a protection for you to know who is that person. But the records, the recordings uh, for the victim, for example, we will be changing the her voice in order not to expose her. But in th theoretically speaking, yes, you are entitled not to expose her, not even at court or for anyone else. You know, but you know, in the Arab countries, they, all the legal troubles within, or issues in this. But within the profi professional um, systems, the correct ones, then yes, you shouldn't expose, but also in order to protect yourself, somebody should know. Yes, Firas? It's not a question, but I want to share an experience that happened with me. We used to make a cross-border uh, idea between uh, Jordan, Palestine, and Egypt, but the idea died in its place. Uh, what's the reason? The reason was that we were three people, but we wanted to, to work on the same story in our three countries, and that's why we wanted to make a joint effort. But then at the end, everyone decided to uh, make a story about their own country and then publish uh, a, a joint theme. But then we decided that each one will publish uh, within their own countries. Yeah, but now you're looking at it within a cold eyes after it ended. What was the main reason? The main reason was um, I believe that for us in the Arab world, we're still not mature enough for uh, group work or like uh, not even cross border, but even within a, within the same uh, agency. Yeah, it's easier for you to work with other agencies than working with journalists within the same newsroom. Yeah, somehow. So if we need to work with cross borders, the cross border groups, what I'm talking about is really advanced. We should go back to the beginning and establish rules and bases for this this work in order not to fail from the fir first trial, like what happened to us. To us. So the idea is that uh, if we want to work uh, on a cross border methodology, so looking at the Arab reporters, they're not even, they do not have extra time. At the beginning, they will commit, but then they will go away. Even those who are well known for their delegation and commitment, they will be away from the scene because they have other tasks to do. And that's the role of the institutes and agencies that want to get within or involved within these experiences. Uh, yeah. That, uh, there were successful uh, experiences from freelancer uh, reporters who worked on investigative reports cross, uh, on a cross-border basis. They had the time to work on a three, four basis or three, four months, uh, So, and some institutions uh, supported them. So when you receive the financing in order to work on this project, you can dedicate some time. But yes, there were 100% su successful experiences from freelancers sometimes. Sometimes it's easier. So your your colleague, the one that you see on a daily basis and that you know all of his stories, sometimes it's problematic to give him full trust. But that one in Norway that you do not know, you feel it's easier for you to work together. It's just psychologically speaking, it's complicated psychologically. But sometimes the locals, how they know about each other, uh, some of the cross borders um, experiences succeeded from only one face to face meeting. Maybe at a personal level, they do not click, they're not friends. But the idea is that they had professional trust plus the need for me in Palestine. And this is a story that I'm going to make about Oslo and the secret negotiations in Norway. I need that uh, Norwegian uh, journalist for my story. And I need um, real stories with a cross-border element uh, that has this clear element because I need that person. Remember uh, the story about Palestine and Jordan? W Jordan, we needed that the uh, reporter in Jordan, otherwise the story wouldn't be published. This need establishes for the trust. Can I continue and then take the uh, questions at the end? Please write them down in order not to forget your questions. If this is urgent, really talk. Uh, I think that in the cross-border 
investigations are more successful when uh, an agency is responsible for it. If the team members only agree on it, then it will fail. But it's more of an agency level responsibility. That's the more successful because it's a trust crisis and also the enthusiasm idea. So this networking is done better by the institutions, by the agencies. They are the source of trust. Yeah, sometimes, just like I said, it is not only one agency responsible for the topic or for the story. Many, many institutes would be responsible for the publication. So they would should have an understanding regarding the roles. And if there is a professional um, journalism institute like Arij, for example, or others, this will give them a a motivation that there will be impact, that there will be a uh, um, publication, but we should have the inner motivation that we want to participate. Okay, regarding the action plan, we should have a time frame. We already decided on the deadline, the publication date. Then we should go backwards. In, in May, what we, should we do? Uh, what, what we should have accomplished in April? What should have we accomplished, etc., etc. So we should have midterm uh, deadlines and also the final deadlines. Also, never, never postpone your deadline. The, the pressures for changing and also choose the proper your, the proper uh, journalism and reporting uh, working methodologies that the ones that are proper to the issue you should choose choose the proper methodology okay research again again this time we, we go back to research asking the diffi difficult questions that we will face problematic issues that we have different uh, topics uh, throughout the different countries we have different cultures we have uh, different applications we have different ethics uh, journalism ethics sometimes you'll find a journalist uh, putting a music piece for um, his or her story and then you call him uh, did you take the proprietary uh, approvals for this music? He would he would go like, um, what do you mean? I just took it off the internet. And then you discover that oh, you have to discuss all over what does it mean to have a proprietary copyright, etc. In this phase, it's really important to rediscuss really everything. This word was said by the source in this methodology. Where is the audio recording? And then you hear it again and you find that it wasn't said this way. So you should check things. Do not take anything for granted. Also, for example, the hidden camera. In certain countries, the last option is to use the hidden camera. In other countries, they get, ah, uh, our first choice is hidden camera. So come on, come on, you should agree on those things. Within the application, in, uh, within the investigation application uh, in practice or reality. Also, the narrative, you should know, like there are uh, very weird and funny introductions written by the journalists, and then we discuss the story. The storytelling in the different countries uh, Defer. Okay. In this phase, that'll be you. Do not be surprised. Do not be shocked. Do not say, oh, the one. You got us into trouble. No. You will fight. But on a, at a professional level, do not take it personally. I'm not mad at a person, and that's why I pick up on him and make problems. No, no, no. It's about that story. It's about a certain obstacle. It's not about a person. That's why we should... Sometimes we will be shocked. Sometimes we will not be receiving uh, the document. For example, sometimes we would be waiting for one month and then we receive a document that is totally irrelevant or didn't expose what we want. Also, discussion, then discussion, and discussion. The most important thing in this phase, we should talk to together. What is the important thing in this story? Each team and each platform should be audited and checked. This is really important and significant in the cross-border investigation. If you have more than one, to check the facts. And also the legal protection for each team, for each member, and for each publication platform, because within the countries of each platforms, uh, within the country, uh, under each 
publication platform they have certain laws and regulations so not everyone can publish everything that's why you should have like law uh, uh, lawyers uh, for example working uh, um for example if the publication is going to be in denmark france and uh, other and uh, britain then you should have at least three lawyers to check the legal stand uh, for them okay regarding the publication there is no one size fits all when the, within this phase each platform would uh, work towards its target audience uh, to would work to on their story yes the research is joint but at the end the stories make Maybe we get like 50 stories from one research. This is what's beautiful about such cross-border investigations because they are at an international level because we have hundreds of local stories that had an impact, a real one. Storytelling is a, a storytelling is a story in its own. You have like the uh, expressions, the language the the speed of it for example in iran it's really slow if you ch if you see their movies oh my god you will close the tv in the arab countries because w we like more speedy things but for the um, german and the france uh, they told us that they are they have started to work on the 16 seconds uh, video that here in the arab world we are uh, uh, we say that we are doing a one or two minutes videos they have reached the 16 seconds videos so we totally defer and we should uh, um, target our audience uh, properly maybe if we make the one minute Maybe for the same investigation, we will make a, a one-minute video. France would make a 16-minute video, and Iran would make a five-minute video. Also, we should respect the local reporter and his knowledge of his audience. I did not know um, if if that reporter tells me that from my experience this will have an impact, then I will respect his experience. I shouldn't impose upon him uh, things that I think it's better. Sometimes we need to do additional research to connect it to the local context and we need to help them audit or check that small part that will be added to the general story. Cross-border cooperation works in circles, as we mentioned. The last step in follow-up is very, very important for new and further networking. So how, in other words, how can we make new networking for new work that we can do after a year or two years from now? It's important to say that we're equal. When it comes to publishing names, we're equal. Sometimes because we have a lot of people, we don't publish the names. If we put them on the website, we will have like 50 persons. So sometimes we don't have enough space to publish all the names of the reporters and the people. But if you ask every one of the reporters, they will tell you, every one of them will tell you that this is my investigation. He knows that there are other people who worked on it, but this is their feeling. Every reporter feels that this is it's his own or her own baby. Maha would like to say something. Recently, people, different people, there's a trend that people work from different countries work on a story and the story in each country publishes the people who worked on it from their country. Actually, if this idea is acceptable by all the parties, it's fine. So what Maha is saying that the Yemeni reporter mentions his name and that he worked with Arij. Other reporters mentioned the, their name and the people who worked from their country. So I think that if it's acceptable, it's fine. But I believe that it should be the names of the persons or the institutions. It shouldn't be a mix. I think if it's fair and acceptable, I think it's a good trend or approach. 
We will go back to other questions and comments, but let me finish here. We need to have a code of conduct from the very beginning. We need to work on it. We need to agree on it. We should make sure that we agree on it, not we think we agree on it. We, we need to believe that we have agreed on it. It's highly recommended that the investigation takes from three to six months, especially cross-border investigations. Otherwise, it will be very time-consuming and effort-consuming. Some investigations lasted for eight years. I know that. And they were successful. However, in normal circumstances, six months should be the max and we should be in the uh, uh, publication process. And this is what happened with the Panama and Paradise Papers uh, before. Benefits. You won't travel, of course, to the 50 countries. We have different reporters and journalists in those different countries. This is one of the benefits. Common mistakes. We talked about foreign journalists. Another mistake is when we have a lot, huge pieces, huge pieces of information. When you, get, for example, we got a leak. One of the mistakes that happened in 2015, 2016, that all the data went to all the parties. So we all work on the data on the same uh, um, way. So we're wasting time and effort. Now we need to uh, divide data, clean data, and send the different clean chunks to the relevant countries to make sure that our work is not duplicative. It's very, very important on the personal level not to waste the time of your colleague or the coordinator, um, even when it comes to uh, half pieces of information. Those small informations that you think are not important are very important. When you have the lead, you need to share it with everybody and make sure that this is a good lead. Do like a search for a day or two before you present it to everybody else and share it with everybody else. There are different reading resources for who are interested. Arabic ones, unfortunately, we don't have Arabic literature for this topic. I'm talking about people who analyzed the experiences we talked about. However, foreign resources we have good ones i recommend manuals in europe that were published in europe those are the best latin america east asia west europe east europe worked well however those who documented accurately documented the whole thing is the uh, english german and french do you know that the U.S. and Canada, it's not that popular and they have undocumented information? It was very difficult for them to work on cross-border investigations and their laws are complicated for us. We haven't talked about techniques or funding, but you understand that we need to talk in detail about them, and we have, we're talking about different cases here. However, let's take questions first. Who would like to speak, please, in the back? What's your name? Hana Abu Hajiya. I'm from Bahrain. I'm an independent journalist. I think you maybe talked a bit about the question I have in mind, but I would like to ask you for your opinion or to have a theoretical answer about my question. I work on a um, labor rights case, and I'm working with a colleague in one of the Asian countries from where we get the laborers. I have the issue in my country, and he has an important role to review all the laws and, and procedures and let me know to see what is legal and what, what it's not. He can communicate in English, but he, work, he has a working command in English. I can talk to him, and we are of equal, our roles are of equal importance. And I'm getting good information from him, but how should I write this story? You said that storytelling can be different from countries. He will give me information in Arabic, and then I will put them in my story. And maybe we will translate later into English. 
but in theory when we have two people and they have the roles are equally important who will write so each one of you will write to their own audiences or to their own country if it's important that if he wants to publish in his local language that you don't understand that you work with translators and interpreters because you need an, a professional one because you need to take accurate information we want to make sure that we avoid anything lost in translation you're working on a working command of English uh, forum but we need to make sure that we have accurate words well uh, actually it, what I write is important what he writes is important about one story and we will put two names I understand as as far as I understand, you will work on what we call a master story. You will have the, like the w big one that you will publish. So I recommend that you write it in Arabic, translate it into English, then translate it from English into his lo local language. After that, he makes sure that he everything is accurate and he understands everything and you understand everything. If he wants to make or to tweak this story for his local audience in a different storytelling style and to have your two names, that's a different story and you need to make sure that you're okay with his storytelling and you need to make sure that your information, information is conveyed accurately. Good morning, Anna Mabrouk Akhdeir from Tunisia. I want to talk about an important thing, which is the communication plan. Sometimes we, when we work on cross-border investigations, we are not on the same page regarding communication, and we are on disagreement at some point. Let me give you an example. The disagreement can be sometimes on how we see the topic that we are working on. Let's say that the issue we're working on, I think that mafia is included. Others think that no, mafia is not included. So let me comment here. As far as I understand, you have um, differences on the hypothesis itself, right? Well, I'm not talking about a personal thing, but let me give you an example to clarify. L last night, we were working on the cross border investigation well mabruka if you don't have the same hypothesis or you haven't laid the common ground I, we need to reconsider and because we can't continue so we need to have all the, to brainstorm to have all the ideas that may challenge this assumption to make until we make sure that this assumption is the foundation and this is a right one because if we have two different assumptions or hypotheses, we won't be able to continue. We, won't, we need to have one. So my recommendation to you is not to continue without having one shared and agreed upon hypothesis. Yes. I understand. Should we agree? have a prior agreement on communication before and after publication and sometimes when we work on cross-border investigations we work with journalists who are in danger how can we advocate for those journalists and protect them another issue is the language is important to work on cross-cultural cross-border investigations on different languages I worked with others from French on from France on um, the language which is French and others uh, with the English language. <laughs> so, Amabruka, all the points you mentioned are important, but let's focus on marketing the investigation. It's not, it doesn't only apply to cross-border investigation. Um, it applies to other investigations, but we need to have a whole plan about publication, who will address the media, if the investigation is developed, we need to have specific spokespersons. This is what happened with the Paradise Papers. We had the three main spokespersons. We can't, for example, in a press, uh, ask anyone to speak on behalf of the story. 
no one, not everyone can work in press conferences. So we need to make sure also that we have all the measures needed to protect the reporters after the story is published. It happened before, and it was rare when we had an accurate, um, an effective protection a plan for reporters. We had crisis management in the past, but we haven't had effective protection uh, uh, plans for reporters. I am Mahdi, reporter from Darfur 24. My question is, I'm from Sudan and I, let's say, work with a reporter from Libya on one investigation. Can I uh, follow up with them on what he works on and what are his tips? Yes, of course, you have to. So he works in a different language and I work in a different language. Who coordinates this? You both, you need to get together at the beginning before you start work and have one plan and work simultaneously on the plan and agree on the language and other points. We have investi investigations like this, but it's not, it's not only applicable. This is not applicable to cross-border uh, investigations to other investigations as well. So you do research together from the different information bring from the different countries as if you are working in the same news room and if you have an editor or not you decide on that so but we prefer not to have two only because if they disagree what's going to happen so make teams of three uh two reporters one researcher so in case the two reporters disagree, we need a third person, at least a third person, to decide on what to do. So do not make a four-person team, a four -person team. Make a five-person team, for example. Uh, please give the mic in the back to my colleague, Fuad Falusa from Morocco. My question about is the fact-checking phase or the auditing. Let's say that we are done with the investigative story, but we need to make it more credible, especially when we talk about political issues. Or one of the team members has a particular political affiliation. So I need to be neutral. Sometimes we are not. And when we talk about political issues, um, we're talking about sensitive issues. And different members, of course, will take the side of their countries and they may not be neutral. So, how can we overcome the neutralism uh, obstacle in uh, fact checking? How can we be objective, not subjective, in cross um, border investigations? So we need to make sure that we agree on the language, on the rhetoric that will be used on the master plan. But we can control local stuff. For example, if we have Algerian reporter who uses a specific language that Morocco considers is an offensive language, and you are part of the team, let's say, you may be blamed to participate in this team if you agree for to publish the story in that offensive language to Morocco. So you are... You participate in the master story, but you are the main person responsible on how this story is published in your own country. And we may not be able or we can't actually follow up on local sto on the master stories when they are published in local languages. So you have two roles in the master story, story to participate and in the local story to make sure that the language use is appropriate to the country specific. But at the end, it's not an UAP. It's an investigation. We need to make sure reporters are, are protected. But if you have your concerns that you should ask to have your name published in the master story, for example, or the local story, and only or both, but not in other stories published in other countries, I have worked on cross culture across border investigations and 
in western in the western world we have they have their own media system and we have our own media system in the arab world I worked on a story for a year and I was not able with my team to publish it. Uh, colleagues in Britain felt upset because we were in danger. So how can we bring uh, the, West, the media system in the Western world and in the Arab world together and to harmonize between them? Ahmad, you said you have a master's degree in the media field, but if you if you can't um, solve the issue, this is an issue. No, actually, my master's was on a different topic. And I focus on uh, access to information, which is a different thing. And I'm still working on my master's uh, degree. I have, I'm not finished with it. So my friend, let me tell you this. The media system in the Arab world is from bad to worse. Um, actually, we don't have a system. We used to have a system in the 90s to 2011. We used to have a system. After 2011, everything we built f for the interest of the system was killed. So we don't have a system. It's not fair even to compare between the two systems in the different parts of the world. And sometimes we ask for no publication to protect the lives of reporters and other colleagues in other countries uh, should understand there's no story that is more important uh, than the reporter's life, regardless of the time, effort, and time consumed. Sometimes in some stories we had to use unreal, unreal names, fake names. But sometimes we need to kill the story. In 2019, I don't have an answer for you about this system. But if I learn about, if I learn an answer in the future, I will let you know. Good morning, Dr. Hashem Hassan, the dean of the Media College in Baghdad University. I may have more experience. My media age is more than those who are here in, in, in the room and I have a lot of experience. I think that cross-border investigations is a compl are complicated investigations and we're dealing with different cultural and systematical contexts here. You talked about research. And, and study, it's studying obstacles, potentials, which is very important. You're talking about the academic and theoretical side, which are very important. In scientific research, we take samples to test the hypothesis, but the absence of but we don't take into consideration the absence of the legal framework or funding. So we need to study all the resources, all the obstacles, all the potentials before we do any task. I, I understand. I, I completely agree. We need to uh, study the risks, not only for cross-border uh, cross investigations, but all investigations. In some of the investigations, we decided not to carry on because the risks are too high. So we need to study the all, all factors. And we may sleep on some investigations, like today, but after three years, we may go back to them with exploring or studying the different factors, we may found out that it's not even the best to start from the very beginning. Uh, it's a non-profit organization in uh, Europe, and uh, you should go to our website because we publish all our cross-border investigations online after it's published. So you get a synopsis in English and also the places where, you, where, where the story is uh, published, so you get an idea how it works. We support that already for more than 10 years. So you get a lot of those uh, projects online. And we have also 
money. So also we give grants to journalists and we have uh, all the questions you, you asked, the, the right questions. You can find some answers there. If not, you can always contact us about all sorts of problems that can occur. So I would also invite you to the session in the afternoon with Marina Walker, who is going in depth also on this topic further on. So that was... Uh, what do you advise, Edis? Is it is it good for journalists in the Arab world to think seriously about cross-border uh, collaborations? Absolutely. It makes you more powerful. It, uh, it, it's, it's, it, it has more impact if you can publish in different countries. And the Arab world has more possibilities in, in one sense, in another sense less. But in, in one sense, uh, you have a unique language. In Europe, it's a lot uh, more difficult. You know, we have... Uh, uh, all those, uh, we don't have a common language. It's starting now to become the English language. But before that, we didn't have that kind of common language which you have already for such a long time. So use that. It's a, it's a powerful tool, a common language. What's the URL that they can check? What's the website? Journalismfund.eu. And it has nothing to do with the commission. Journalismfund.eu. Yes. Our friend from Belgica, from Brussels, they support cross-border investigations and he invites all of you um, to a, a forum or a workshop that will be talked about today evening. And uh, like I said, cross-border and Investigations is the, the most important topic or, or kind of investigations these days. Uh, we have issues in the uh, Arab world regarding the media system, that's true, but um, we have a good tool, a powerful tool, which is the Arabic language. In Belgica, there are three languages, for example. In the Western world, they don't have a common language. But here in the Arab world, we have this powerful tool, and Arabs do not aware, uh, or not, do not appreciate this tool. And actually, they look down to the Arabic language. We should be proud of our language. I'm proud that we speak a common language in this part of the world. We will take two more final questions. Mike, please, for translation purposes or interpreting process. I'm from Palestine, a reporter from Palestine. My question is, in case we have different ex levels of experiences between the different reporters who work together on cross-border investigations, how can we solve this issue? Because the product will be different, the results will be different, of different levels of quality. True. To fix this issue, we used to have intensive trainings to upgrade the skills of reporters. So we can't have a huge gap in terms of skills between reporters. Of course, they will be different, different levels, but we the, the gap can't be huge. Other experienced reporters can support other reporters, but the gap should not be huge. If we are working on the same material, same database, or the databases, we need to have close skills. We can help each other, we can invest in each other, but we need to have intensive training skills to those who see that there will be an asset for this investigation and in the future. Otherwise, we will have an issue um, in the work and this will sabotage our work. The last question, the last question, um, delegate, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Amrasha Awad from Sudan. I have a question. We reporters are always interested in applying uh, investigative journalism criteria and professional criteria in general. When we talk about cross-border investigations, I'm sure that in the Arab world, where we have issues with access to information, access to sources, it will be hard to commit or abide by professional criteria. And if we insist on applying the professional criteria, we won't be able to do investigations or we will do limited investigations. For example, in Sudan, or the laws are against media. We don't have even one law that obliges um, governmental institutions to have the reporters do their work. In addition to the security threats we face, 
Yes, unfortunately, what's applied in Sudan is applied in a number of Arab countries to criminalize simple investigative journalism work. So the solution here is not to ab not not to abide by professional criteria because we have to. If we can't do the investigation, it will become a feature. And we understand, as reporters, it's not an investigation, it's a feature. We know that we tried to make it an investigation, but we couldn't for some reason, so we made it a feature instead of an investigation. And a lot of companies or agencies removed their names from the investigations because they were made features. And it's happened before. At least we tried to highlight the issue in a feature, not an investigation. In the Arab world, we have a lot of, uh, we have an issue of calling some features investigations, but we know as reporters that these are not investigations, these are features. There are investigations that are of high quality, can compete with international investigations, but there are features, not investigations, that because of different reasons, work conditions, we couldn't make them investigations, and we are familiar with such things in the Arab world. Sometimes we couldn't even approve the hypothesis because we did not have access to sources, and we had to make a reportage and a story, but not an investigation. I would like to thank you very much for all the interventions that prove that you're interested in this topic and you have experiences. I'm available on social media. I have my business card here with me with my contact details. Do not, if you have my number, do not send me good morning and good afternoon on WhatsApp. Send me real stuff. And I am happy to continue working with you in the future. Thank you very much for coming here and enjoy the rest of the workshops uh, during the conference. Thank you very much.